So back in the fall, we were joined by Nick Laufenberg in a 10 minute talk to talk about why a lightweight rifle isn't always best. But in this one, lightweight Dave himself joins us to talk all about ultralight rifles, where they make sense, their pros and cons, calibers that make sense in ultralight rifles, and then we kind of go on some other tangents about ultralight hunting and packing in general. We do want to hear some of your guys' ultralight solutions you might have too, so let us know in the comments below. Also let us know questions down there as well. But otherwise, thanks for tuning in as always and enjoy this one. What's up, everybody? We're locked and loaded over here. Well, okay, I shouldn't say that because no. there are firearms on the table. They're not loaded. They're safe. They have chamber flags in. Man, <laughs> right off the bat, already having a <laughs> caveat. Backtrack. Uh, lightweight Dave joins us in the studio once again. Yes. It's an exciting day. He's got his laptop in front of him. Gonna. He said he brought a bunch of nerdy spreadsheets, so that's good. Uh, Ryan Muckenhern also across the table, so good having him. Marco to my left, and we're going to talk today about ultralight rifles. And it, I w would you say it's it's safe to say ultralight in this case? Because I know the gun on the table in front of us right now in the middle here set up, that's Dave, one of your ultralight guns. Yep. Um, we got a Weatherby on the table here. We got some uh, cool action going on behind Ryan over there. There some, they are. Some, some rifles he brought in as well. And, um, man... The best place it seems to start, though, is discussing sort of why ultralight rifles, you know, how what makes them ultralight, uh, applications, all that stuff. I mean, obviously, when you're talking about weight, right? And you, and you talk about making something ultralight, the the object is, or you you're assuming you're probably going to be carrying it a lot. Well, I think we can pros and cons. Pros and right? cons, exactly, exactly. Yep. So, Dave. When you had this rifle built here, mm -hmm. and everybody knows you as Lightweight Dave, you have a certain very specific application that you want to use this particular rifle for. Mm -hmm. um, what is that? Why is it so conducive to having this ultralight rifle? And um, yeah, kind of explain the process that went into how you decided, you know, pros and cons, where you would be willing to shave weight, where you wouldn't be willing to shave weight. Yeah. How'd that process go? Yeah, so um, I'm I've been doing the uh, Montana Unlimited Sheep Hunt um, for a couple of years now. This will be my second time, I guess. I wasn't able to go last year, um, and actually, this rifle was it didn't quite get done for um, the 2018 trip, but it's done now, and I've got another one that's actually on its way in. Um, that's very similar for my buddy, and um, right now I got a little bit of heavier scope on it, but uh, I'm going to be going with a, a prototype of something lighter weight that we're working on. And, um, yeah, it's just, you know, for, for sheep hunting, just wanted to get the lightest thing that I can. The unlimited is, um, an extremely rugged terrain. Um, you're, you're walking a lot of miles. You're getting way back in, in the back country. You're doing a lot of bushwhacking, especially until you get to the higher elevations. Um, so, um, you know, a lot of those uh, reliability, but also size and weight, um, are big concerns. Um, you know, and there's definitely, you know, you're thinking about you're in big country out there, um, so you could you can make the argument for you know going with a heavier caliber something that's flatter shooting especially in wind, um, but you know th those those generally are a little bit heavier. Um, so part of it for me also is is the challenge. So um, while I could haul up something a little bit heavier, I like the challenge of um, having to put the bullet where it needs to go and thinking about all of the environmental variables. Um, you know if you've got a real bad windstorm, maybe you just have to get closer, and that's part of the challenge is having to stalk closer um, a little bit. Um, so yeah, that's, that's kind of what, what drove me to build this. And, um, you know, I, I really like the target style, um, stocks. Um, some of the real ultralight mountain guns have more of the traditional stock and I shoot better with this. So shooting accurately was really important for me. That was one of the areas that I compromised a little bit on weight. Um, but, um, you know, with my friend, uh, Glenn Seekins, I was able to really get that pretty close to some of these more traditional style stock weights. Um, yeah. So yeah, for you, pretty much everything is a challenge. Uh, this is, <laughs> I, I will say, having known you for a little bit, um, and so I can see where the challenge comes into how many ounces can you shave. That's part of the yep. the fun or the challenge of it. Yep. The challenge comes from doing a hunt that few dare to try. 
where how many miles do you usually wind up rucking? You're camping, you're taking everything with you. I mean, we were maybe 25 miles back at the furthest point, okay. something like that, <laughs> from, from the truck. <laughs> so, right. yeah, I know the last day we walked 20 miles, and it was very, very little of it was on trail. So okay. that, that was yeah. just for fun, right? Like, exactly. what are we gonna do? <laughs> that was just a warm up. That was no, just to good. go see that thing over there. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, so you have, there's that challenge aspect and you bring up the accuracy aspect of it too. Mm-hmm. So it, it, being that we want to nerd out specifically on the lightweight gun act or aspect of this, mm-hmm. can you walk us through just real quick? And then, and then I'm sure we'll get into some of these pros and cons this setup in yep. front of us, kind of all the pieces you chose, why you chose them and, uh, stuff like that. Sure. So, um, uh, like I said, my buddy Glenn Seekins um, is making these stocks right now for his Havac rifles, um, if you're familiar with those, or Seekins Precision. Um, so it's a carbon fiber stock. It's got um, kind of that target shape to it, the shape that I really like, um, you know, something that you might see like on a Manners EH1 or something like that. Um, so I wanted to have that shape. I, I can shoot I can shoot better with that shape, um, but, you know, the stock itself is just a little over 20 ounces um, um, being carbon fiber like that. Is that where you um, started? You started with a stock? And then you figured everything else around it. Or well, you maybe the caliber action? actually. Oh, maybe caliber. the caliber okay. was probably where I went. And and there's a lot of good ones out there. Um, I like the six five Creed more for almost everything that's elk and, and smaller. Um, you know, a lot of guys think that's too small for elk or um, you know that kind of thing. Even even for sheep or deer, guys think it's too small. Um, but I'm all about putting the bullet where it needs to go. I've I've shot quite a few animals with the six five Creed more, and they've all it's done really well for me every time, even at at longer ranges um, for a gun like this. So um, I have all my reloading equipment for it. There's some other newer calibers that I think our guys really like, but I just know this one and I have the reloading equipment for it. So, so for me, the short action, um, you know, to shave some weight, the six, sure. the six five Creed more. Just knowing that there's a lot of components for it, um, it's really easy to reload. Um, that's that's why I like it. And and I think a lot of guys think you need bigger, but if you put that bullet where it needs to go, six five is plenty good. Um, a couple of my, one of my other six, five Creedmoor rifles, it's a 24 inch barrel. Um, I shot a mule deer in Wyoming at over 700 yards with it and it dropped. And then a few weeks later, my brother took that same, um, rifle out, my twin brother, Sam, and shot an elk in the Wasatch range at 750 with the same, with the same rifle, which is pretty far for a six, five Creedmoor on an elk. And it dropped, um, right away. So, you know, just putting the bullet where it needs to go. So yeah, the the caliber for me is where it's at. I like the 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 short action calibers. I like the six five Creed more. Um, I'm using a Pierce uh, Precision Titanium action, um, so titanium. that's that's really lightweight. Yep, um, I, I I I like it quite a bit. It's really light. How much um, weight does that save over a regular steel action? It's well, this is sixteen ounces. The Which, whole thing, the action, yeah, the whole action like is with sixteen the ounces with it? the bolt, yeah, oh um, it's sixteen ounces. So I think a lot of the other ones are well over twenty, um, maybe closer to double, double that almost. Whoa! Um, so it's it shaves quite a bit of weight off. What um, do you, how do you feel about like I know when some people use the titanium actions, it's a little bit, it's not as slick or as smooth. You know, it's a little bit that's grittier. true. That's true. They're not as they're not as smooth. Um, you know, but. Uh, I think they're smooth enough for, for hunting. Probably not something so, you use in a PRS competition where you're going to be right. racking a lot of rounds, high yeah. round count. But yeah. Now, this rifle yeah. is short, too. I um, mean, it looks like you about put it in your pocket. What? No, it almost, yeah. I, you would think it's like an SBR. Right. <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah. Does this we, need paperwork? We, we forgot uh, to, we haven't mentioned that yet. It's just barely, <laughs> like, <laughs> by, by about an eighth of an inch, it's legal. So it is. Okay. Uh, yeah. But that, that titanium action, do you find that that, um, like helped or hindered kind of like the balance point of the rifle for carrying the rifle or does when you add the scope, does that... It actually worked out pretty good for me. Yeah, it, it, it works out pretty good for me. And I mean, it's got a proof barrel on there so that, you know, um, carbon fiber barrel yeah, it lighten seems up the front end a little bit too. With the carbon barrel, with the fact that that barrel... So that barrel is like, what is that, like 16.5 inches or something? Yeah, I think so. 16 okay. and a half, 16 and a quarter, something like that. <laughs> yeah. So going with a lighter barrel set up like that and then a shorter barrel set up mm-hmm. too, when I was holding it, it seems like one of those things where if you have a heavy action in barrel and then you get a lightweight carbon stock, well, then it's really heavy out front. Yep. Or if you get a lightweight carbon barrel and a lightweight action, but then you have some big mamba jamba stock, it gets heavy in the rear, which some people may prefer that over the other one. Mm-hmm. But this one, when you pick it up, it's light across yeah. the board. Like it, yeah. it, it, have you ever picked up a good. feather, Jim? 
Uh, yeah. It's like that. It is. I agree. <laughs> I agree. Yeah. Going into the barrel selection, though, how did you determine to go with such a short barrel? That's that's something that seems to be on a lot of the... So, I mean, we look at the... There's Weatherby here, Ryan, all the guns you brought in pretty much. Yeah. What are the what are the lengths on those barrels? 24, Between 22? 22 and 24. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that seems to be kind of the, the standard. This is, this is a little bit of like... Uh, if you just took a picture and you cropped out the barrel, you'd think, oh, totally normal. And then you bring in the barrel, you're like, well, that looks funny. <laughs> yeah, it, it almost looks like a little like a toy gun or something like that. But um, yeah, it was it was a it was a debate for sure. I mean, I think for me, it's a it's a game. You know, there's a lot of guys who say, well, just you know, work out in the gym more if if you know um, if you instead of you know going to extreme lengths for going lighter weight. And yeah, you can do that. But for me, it's just. It's just one of the things that and I you find do do fun. That. I was going to say, you're you know? doing both. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I am doing both. I mean, but yeah, you know, I'm going to take every advantage I can get, but it's also a game for me. I enjoy seeing how light I can get. Um, that it's kind of fun to see how, how little you can go out into the wilderness with and make it happen. So, um, you know, in that vein, I, I did a bunch of calculations on how much you save for every inch you cut off a barrel and, um, you know, looked at that and, um, so I just decided I'm going to go for it, right? Uh, I'm going to be all about putting the bullet where it needs to go. Yeah, it's going to be slower at 16 inches, but I'm going to I'm going to you know take that weight off of there, um, you know. And I think I can't remember exactly what I'm at, but I'm over 2,600 feet per second on my reloads. That's what um, I was going to ask because I know okay. you're you're hand loading for this thing, yep. and they're pretty hot, so you're yep. kind of compensating for that reduction in barrel length and some of that reduction in velocity yep. with with the hand loads that you're. And it sounds like they're doing really well. And, and yeah, and you're shooting 140. 143 um, ELDXs, ELDXs. Yeah. yeah. And so, yeah. like, the posted box velocity on that round from Hornady is 2,710 feet per second. Yeah. Right. So what are you really giving up? Right. You know? Yeah. Well, and, and when I use, I know I've used the factory ammunition yep. out mm-hmm. of the Ruger American with a 24-inch yep. barrel, and I'm getting about 26, 30, 26, yep. 26, yeah. 30 yeah. to 26, you know, anywhere in there. Yep. And I'm getting 29, 20. On a twenty-four inch barrel with my reloads. Oh, okay. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Do you are you are you designating any specific barrel twist rate with a shorter barrel? Does that does that it's come about one and eight if I remember right? Does that so? And how does that like? I'm trying to think of. Th- this is this is purely not based on any knowledge of how you know barrels and all that stuff work. I'll, I'll admit, but. I would think if you have a shorter barrel, maybe you go with a tighter twist rate so you can get that twist going, or maybe it actually doesn't really matter. You use the same twist rate as you would with a longer barrel, and it's... I think if you got really short, it would make a difference, but twist rate has more to do with the length of the projectile than, okay. than anything else. Okay. If, and, and then you have to start putting into factor, like, velocity and bullet construction and things like that, but bullet length is really what drives twist rate. And oh, then with length, okay. weight... So, so how a, many, how many, how much of the lands you're getting on the bullet, so to speak? Does it, is that how it works, or as far as as like far as the length st- of the projectile and and the twist rate? So if it's a tighter twist rate, you're getting you're rotating you're it? rotating the bullet more in a shorter distance with yeah. a faster twist rate. Yeah. So there's a formula. It's called the Greenhill formula, and I think it's a pretty old formula that is used to suss out twist rate for the most part. And there's a lot of other things that come into play with it too. But yeah. Um, a one and eight twist is fairly standard, regardless of barrel length on a six five nowadays. Um, so you know, if you look at some of the six five Grendels, for instance, that have like a fourteen five or a sixteen inch barrel, which is really common, ninety nine percent of them are twisted one and eight. Hmm. Okay, um, a one and nine is starting to get a little bit on the slow side for a six five in any barrel length. Um, so this this par for the course. Um, I, I don't think that going shorter would necessarily dictate going with a faster twist rate because you would run into other issues too. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, if you over twist a bullet, you know, we've talked about You'd that spin before. it apart, right? Yeah. Depending on the bullet. Uh, but you then would have to like up the velocity considerably too. Like if you were to go with a one in six and shoot 143 grain ELDX, I think that you'd probably run into stability issues or yeah. keeping the bullet together or pressure issues or a whole bunch of other goofy stuff that could come up from that but yeah yeah uh that's that's par for the course when going uh so sticking with the barrel conversation interesting stuff around twist rates now i have more stuff to look up myself but sticking with the barrel though so this is this is one of those carbon wrapped barrels Mm -hmm. i remember the first time i saw this i thought to myself how the heck are they making a barrel out of carbon but it's actually (laughs) a steel barrel under there Mm -hmm. it's just wrapped in carbon fiber and uh 
and that, I mean, for those not familiar with it, I mean, that's just a, it's, it's a means to get a thinner, lighter weight contour barrel in steel that's actually doing the job of being the barrel for the bullet to travel down, but then stiffen it with this carbon fiber wrap around it. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, I mean, basically, that's it. Got it. And then maintain relatively lightweight. Mm-hmm. And you've got a muzzle brake on the end, too? Yep. Yeah, right now, it's a, I think it's a Hawkins Precision Titanium brake on there, but um, I'm, I'm contemplating... Um, running a can on the end of this for the hunt, mm-hmm. and so I have oh, okay. uh, I have one made. I think it's a Stinger Stinger Works can. Mm-hmm. It's about nine ounces, and they have uh, another. They have their own titanium brake that works with their can, and it's like one point one ounces for that brake. Oh wow! Yeah, so I may I may swap it out for that one just because it interfaces with the can. But I've got to, you know, make up my mind if I want to haul the extra nine ounce. And that's I mean it's an eight inch can and it's nine ounces, so that's pretty. Light. light for so, yeah, that is for a doubling the length of the rifle. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know, I know. So, so I got a question, <laughs> and I, 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 it wouldn't put, I wouldn't put it past you to to have done the research. But did you look at the, I guess, maintaining the length of the barrel or increasing the length of the barrel and not having it breaked, and kind of like the velocity versus weight reduction there? Or were you, were you always like, nope, I'm putting a break on it? Um. I didn't look at that a whole lot. I mean, I knew that the the perceived recoil, I think, would be higher mm-hmm. the shorter the barrel is, so that's why I put the brake on there. But, you know, it's obviously going to be louder just from being short and having a brake. So that's where I thought just, you know, I don't know. I mean, call me weak, I guess, but I usually wear earplugs when I hunt, just trying to save oh, my ears a little bit. smart. Yeah. And, and so the, the just... idea was if I could have a can and I didn't have to – fumble around with earplugs and I like to be able to hear really well. I don't want to carry electronic hearing pro, especially in the unlimited. Um, you know, um, so I'm trying to get away with not having to carry earplugs at all. So that was the idea behind just Mm -hmm. not having to worry about it or think about it. Um, but that's, you know, an extra nine ounces to carry that can out there. So some big advantages to the suppressor though. I, I mean, yeah. So I hunted suppressed for the first time last year and I took an antelope, um, at a little over three and a quarter. And he, he was with a group of like 12 or 14 other antelope. Mm-hmm. But they didn't know what happened. Right. <laughs> and and, and yeah. for me, from like a game management standpoint, uh, on that particular property that it's we true. were hunting, I could have then continued to hunt that group for the rest of the week that I was out yeah, there if I had point. other tags. And, you know, if you're trying, especially if you're hunting with another person, you're not trying to blow game out of the area. Sure. I, we'll I both mean, have a tag. Yeah. You know. I mean, it was it was astounding to me, yeah. having never hunted suppressed myself. When I pulled the trigger, he dropped, and the others just looked around like, <laughs> "Oh, that was weird." Yeah, yeah, why did Jerry take a nap? And, <laughs> yeah, and so t- I actually think it was it was kind of a from an like an ethical standpoint a better thing to do. Hmm. I was also hunting, you know, the property is very large that we were on. But there were three other shooters up there with us, you know, within a mile or so. And when I got back to camp. They came back. They they asked me, "Did I get one?" Well, usually we know who shot. If, right. If, yeah, you can hear it. Yeah, mm-hmm. and so I didn't goof up their hunt. I didn't disturb the rest of the game in the area. Yeah, I thought it was a a really awesome thing to that, have. That's yeah. interesting about yeah. you know that's just being point. being less disruptive and yeah. and like yeah. Dave's saying, you know, if you're or you know, oftentimes we hunt together with somebody, yep. and yeah. you, if you get that opportunity, you know, instead of maybe doing the the one, hey, two, bro, three. put your earplugs in. Yeah. Right. You know, I'm not waiting for that. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> but, but to your point in the unlimited, I mean, if you did you see a sheep when you went in there the first time? No, not a single one, not a lamb, you right. nothing. No, I mean, hardly any game just, at all. Does, and that's yeah. you read the books, and that, that's the way it is. And we saw some mountain goats. Yep. It's really hard for a non resident to get a mountain goat tag. Some years you can't even get one. Um, we saw, I saw, uh, a doe with a um, a fawn twice, right? And we saw one grizzly bear and one black bear. Wow! In in twelve days of wow. hunting, My so goodness. yeah, it was it, it. It's just, and that's what I've heard when you go up in there. I mean, it can be kind of demoralizing. You you really have to have a different mindset when you hunt yeah. that. Um, so yeah, it's. I mean, guys say I I know I, I've read stories of guys going in three years in a row before Never they saw sheep. their first sheep. Right, and right if you've there. got two guys in there with a tag, yeah. And there's a chance that you see two 
Rams. And oftentimes they are in groups. Yeah. I mean, yeah. to have the suppressor on there could, good point. could be absolutely the difference between one of you getting a sheep or both of you getting a sheep. Right, yeah. Just by not blowing and closing out the unit. Yeah. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> Quoting out the unit, yeah. right? There, Which, there's two Ram quota in each yeah. unit, you know? Get, and, get so, the phone out. So <laughs> you, you know, Paul, Paul Neese has talked about when he, he took a sheep up in Alaska and he shot it suppressed. Yeah. The, he, they didn't move for quite a while because the other Rams didn't react to that animal being it's a great point big. yeah yeah and so that that's a that's a huge bonus for from the buddy yeah. perspective not only did you keep his and your hearing intact but you yeah. also potentially allowed him to take another animal yeah we should talk about the weight of this too i mean it, probably our listeners are like tell me what it weighs oh no, yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly yeah, right. for crying out loud because <laughs> well, uh, you also have because there's also a bipod on here too there is yeah so without the scope and the bipod or the rings it's i think it's five pounds one ounce wow um so, and with this kind of a stock on it with that more target shape, I think that's pretty good. Um, yeah, the bipods, I think it's like four ounces total for all the hardware, everything on there. And that's one of those neopods. It's made Wait, in what that, bi- the um, whole yeah, thing? the whole thing with all the hardware and everything. <laughs> and it's, it's under four ounces. It weighs as much me. as a, a, a patty from Culver's. How much yeah. does it? <laughs> yeah. uh, <laughs> now, yeah. I'm, now I'm hungry. That's one way um, to put it. How yeah. far does that extend, Dave? Um, it's it extends. It's just like uh, all the other, you know, your your Atlas or your Harris. I mean, it it goes. Oh wow! Out to it's okay, a, not that's bad. a twelve inch bipod. Yeah. By the time you're done goofing around, yeah. and yep. for for so. all practical purposes, you know, I used to hunt with tall bipods, and I found them cumbersome more than anything. Mm-hmm. And and so, for those who can't see this, and I'm sure we'll get a picture of it after the fact. Yeah. The bipod is exactly the length that you would want for a hunting bipod, yep. and then to shoot off of any taller. And you'd be in an uncomfortable position, mm-hmm. uh, whereas this is like this is the height to get, in yeah. my opinion, on a hunting bipod. Mm-hmm. No I question about it. I think it's going it. to be the most versatile. So with that, I can figure out how to get it off here. I don't remember. We're doing a little bit of uh, gun plumbing, right tactical, right tactical right gun plumbing here. Good thing yeah. we got a. Uh, maybe we'll have to do this later. Oh, there, there we go. There we go. There yeah. it so is. So there, you guys can pass around and see how light that thing is. Yeah, you know those really ultralight uh, forks that you get for eating your your mountain house and yeah. Heather's choice meals. It's uh, it's a little bit lighter than those. So <laughs> let me see that. Hey, by the way, Jen, have you seen my spork? Yeah, yeah, it's in uh, the studio here. Oh, that's cool. So, so Dave, you said you're at about five pounds. What was it? One ounce. Yeah, with. Uh, no scope and no bipod? Is that what right, it was? Right, right. Yeah, and without the rings on there, too. And without yeah. the rings yep. on there. Now, yep. you, you have right now the AMG 6 to 24 yep. on this gun. And that's a that's a pretty dang good scope to put on something like this. It now, is, you yeah. said, I know there's there's you know prototypes and stuff like that you're working on you might mm-hmm. put on that might be a little bit lighter. But you're getting all the features. Do you shoot, like, do you have any guns you're shooting the Gen 2 Razors on? Or I do, other yeah. Stuff like that. So you're getting yep. basically all the same features, and I'm holding this bipod now, and it's ridiculous. I could throw it at you, and it wouldn't hurt. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'd be all right. Yeah, just exactly. That's crazy. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so you're getting all the same features as those scopes in this rifle scope that weighs what do the AMGs weigh? Like twenty eight point eight, twenty eight point eight ounces. That's not bad. Yeah, no, twenty eight point eight ounces though. I mean, <laughs> it's twenty ounces lighter than a Gen two. It is. Yeah. It is. I mean, that's a that's twenty ounces of water. When well, you, then when our you, new LHT that just came out. Yep, that's yeah. lighter. I, that's, I was surprised. That's a half a pound lighter than the AMG. I because I, I know you've you know hunted with the scope on on this rifle or you know these types of rifles yep. rifles before, and it is a phenomenal. I mean, for a fully featured long really range well. scope. Yep, it's probably the lightest on the market with those types of features. Yep. but yeah, the new the new LHT, you know, that's which is on your Weatherby over which there. Is what I got on this Weatherby and yeah. Killed a couple uh, things with it. Nothing at extreme distance. I guess I killed two bucks in Wisconsin. One was at 2.30. And I think I killed yeah. a bear at like 2.30 with it too, not in Wisconsin, yeah. but up in Alaska. Yeah. But it's a, it's kind of like a fully featured, lightweight, long-range scope. Mm-hmm. Well, it is, yeah. As well. Now, you have, you've had this AMG on here for a while. I mean, in fact, I think we were just discussing earlier. It might earlier. even be a prototype, I was going to say, this might be an original <laughs> prototype yeah, I can't AMG. remember. Um, to look at the serial number on it. So I don't yeah. blame you for necessarily switching it with the new introduction of the LHT at the time of this recording. But um, what magnification, so that's a 3 to 15 mm-hmm. there, and then this is 624. What magnification do you find yourself, or would you say in a situation in an unlimited mountain hunt, for example, yeah. uh, what magnification would you find yourself probably being on? I think in, just around that 20 or a little over that 20. 
Okay. Yeah, I mean, for some shots, for sure. Yeah. I mean, it, you can get some pretty big open country there. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. 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 Th- I mean, that's where it is nice to have that that extra magnification when yeah. you when you really are reaching out there and trying to be ultra ultra precise. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You can do it with less, but yeah, I mean, like that that um you know a few years ago when I shot that deer in Wyoming at j- over seven hundred, I was on. 24 power. Um, oh, really? Yeah, I was on 24 for that one. Um, I don't know. I'll have to ask Sam. I think he was on 24 when he shot that elk in the Wasatch at 750. Mm-hmm. So we talked I think about it was this scope, actually, too. This I just scope, took it this off scope my other rifle. Around, yeah. It's been it, around it the block. Yep. Ser- serial number doesn't have one. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> and we've talked a little bit on other podcasts, too, about how some people have a tendency to overscope their gun, but that's also yeah. then not to say that there isn't times where, and I think mm-hmm. we've, we've tried to say that in this, this is a perfect example, mm-hmm. isn't times where you would want a fair amount of magnification. Yeah. Um, Dave, how about on your computer here? What's what? What were all the things that went in your spreadsheet? <laughs> so yeah, we're I'm, getting out of rifle territory I'm very, there. I'm but, very uh, curious about about your spreadsheet here because this, I mean, you you yeah. don't necessarily. So spe- talking about lightweight, ultra lightweight rifles. It mm-hmm. doesn't really make sense to put all of the time and nerding and investment into building an ultralight rifle if the rest of your kit around it isn't going to be right. also ultralight, right? I mean, otherwise, you're just sort of like, oh, that's cool. I guess your yeah. one thing is lightweight, but if everything else isn't. Yeah, I mean, you know, there's this saying that say uh, ounces equal pounds and pounds equals pain. You know, I don't, the pain part, whatever, but um, for me, it's that game, and, and you really can. The, Every little thing you scrutinize, you can get weight down on. And so I just wanted to do an exercise and start playing around with a spreadsheet and see what would happen when I did different things when I first started this uh, a number of years ago. And so, yeah, I started tracking everything and then grouping things into different areas. And I also got a little frustrated because I would see things online from different companies that would say, hey, we make, we make this kit and we make all this different gear. And they would show a picture of here's all this gear and that's all you need for hunting. And it weighs this much. And I'd look at it and I'd be like, well, they don't have any food in there. They don't have any, like they don't make, they don't make a water container of any kind. They don't make any kind of water purification. So it doesn't have literally everything in there. Hmm. And so I was like, I want to know what stuff really weighs. And it was pretty astounding when I started putting it together and looking at what I could take out of there and, or, you know, going online and you'd say, well, if I had this piece of gear that, you know, and sometimes it's not even hunting gear. I'll find stuff on ultralight, you know, backpackers that, you know, do through hiking on like the Appalachian Trail or something like that. And, and you plug that in and see what it would weigh. And it's pretty astounding how much weight you can shave off. So, and so that's what I did is, and I, I, on my spreadsheet, I made areas for different things. I, I mean, I put food in there. Um, I have a whole um, tab on there where I actually calculate calories per ounce. Um, and I put different food in and I see what it weighs and how food many, per how day. How many rows do you have in your spreadsheet used? A lot. <laughs> 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 yeah. And multiple tabs, you know? Um, but that was the other thing is you'll see guys online say, Oh, well I went in and my kit weighed, you know, 25 pounds or 30 pounds, but they're, they're almost never including food when they say that they're almost never including water. And so I have it broken down a different weight. So assuming I have like a full container of water at any given time, that's maybe two to three liters. Um, what does that weigh? What does my food weigh? Um, you know, other miscellaneous things you'll see a lot of times they don't include optics in there or yeah. other things like that. If it's, if it's a brand that make, doesn't make optics, right. Or they make, maybe they make clothing or tents or something like that. Um, Oh, or they're not staying for multiple, multiple days. How long are you usually out on the uh, on the unlimited hunt that you go? So two years ago, we um, it was a 12-day hunt, and I think we're going to do at least that this time. That's maybe, a lot of days. Yeah, maybe two weeks, maybe a full two weeks. We a lot managed, of food. We managed yeah. to load up an entire Subaru for four days. <laughs> yes. I mean, really lightweight <laughs> food, like really lightweight backpacking Dave, are you bringing food. a solar panel? No, no, I'm no. Not. Oh, okay. no, I'm well, not. Interesting. They're too heavy. Well, uninteresting. And, and I don't think I need the power for um to to recharge that much. Actually, so power the power side of things, I found. So I use this headlamp that's made by Zebra, and they use these eighteen six fifty batteries. They're mm-hmm. about an ounce and a half. You can get batteries that have thirty five hundred milliamp hours in one battery, which you know a lot of these cell phones are about three thousand. So it's as much or maybe more than the battery power in your cell phone. So you could, you could fully charge your cell phone with one of those. And um, you run your headlamp off of it. So I'm really big into dual-use stuff. Um, if, and this is kind of one of the examples. But you can get this device just off of Amazon. It's cheap. It's like 5 bucks, And it's 
probably an ounce, ounce and a half. And it's got little magnetic connectors that go on each end of the battery. And then it's got a USB port and you can use it to charge things with it. So you can actually oh. draw power off of these little batteries. So you're, they're like, the, the little tiny battery just becomes like a portable battery pack. Yep, exactly. Just a, hmm. oh. Yeah, and they're an ounce and a half, but they can also go in your headlamp. Um, and they're, they're a little bit bigger than a AA battery mm-hmm. would be. Um, so I really like those. And I've, like, last two years ago when I was out there, I would just turn my phone on when I wanted to take a picture and then turn it right back off. Um, I had an inReach Mini with me, and I would turn it on whenever I need to use it, turn it off. It lasted the whole time. I had 80% battery power when it was done. Um, you know, and if you're, and, and I carried a sat phone too. So if you're, if you're single, you know, maybe you don't have to do that. There's, you know, that's kind of a heavy item, but, um, I, you know, married, I have kids. So it's kind of like, there's, there's some things I do that I don't, I didn't used to do. Right. I have right. some more responsibilities. So I carried <laughs> my sat phone. I would turn it on. I'd call home for like a minute or two each day or check the quota status, um, you know, once or twice a day or whatever. And that battery was like at 85% by the end of, so it, it's like I had way more battery power than I needed. My headlamp never even came close to being used up. So I have one in the headlamp and I might just go with one more in my backpack somewhere and I can use that to juice up, you know, the sat phone if it goes dead or juice up the inReach mini if I need a rescue or juice up my cell phone if I need to take a picture or whatever. What are you so. using for navigation? Because I'm basically running my Onyx and checking that thing <laughs> probably probably more than I should. I'd probably... Mark, uh, you check Onyx like gym. a millennial teenage girl checks Instagram and Oof, Snapchat. Duh. <laughs> That might be I the can't, bur- like, I can't, the I podcast even, burn of 2020. Yeah. <laughs> hey, the, All the, of our millennial teenage girls now don't like Gore-Tex. <laughs> <Yep. laughs> the, the sad part is, is like, I don't have a rebuttal. <laughs> Shoot. Like, so, uh, oh, yeah, it's so, pretty accurate. Well, to shame but, you even more, I just use a map and compass. I, and, and actually, I don't even use the, the very compass that much. I mean, you know, just... I, you know, I I was trained on a lot of map and compass um, oh, stuff true. Yeah. over the years and various things that I've done. You know, like the National Outdoor Leadership School, I did a month long mountaineering course with them when I was in college, and and some other things that I've done as well. Um, but yeah, I mean, just dead reckoning honestly works, especially when you're in the mountains. It's about all you need is a map and dead reckoning, and that's about it. So I mean, if you're trying to nail like a where's that tree stand or where's that trail cam I put up or whatever, but for mountain hunting out west, for me, I. I don't think I used Onyx one time on that hunt. Um, it was just the map, and I don't even think I brought the compass out. To be honest, it was just the map. So hmm. amazing. Yeah. I mean, that's what when, when we're talking with uh, Remy Warren when we're doing the uh, the Coos Deer podcast, and I think we're doing some stuff on talking about navigation. I mean, and that's one thing. I mean, so number one, I think Onyx is an invaluable tool. So tool, so not to discredit it at all, but I do know I suffer from paying too much attention to my phone, yeah. and I'd probably get around. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I'll use it if, if I if, if I you can. picked your head up. Well, and there's this yeah. weird thing that happens too, where like when you're pulling your phone out a lot and putting it back in your pocket, sometimes there's like different buttons you can end up accidentally pushing that make like a weird little Siri beep. And then, you know, I don't know, <laughs> you might be like stalking up on a deer and every time yeah. you go to check Onyx, I don't know, maybe hundred yards or something, every hundred yards, 50 yards, maybe even every time you put your phone back in your pocket, it goes, doo doo. sorry, I didn't get that. Hmm. Yeah. I guess I don't know what you're talking no, about. No, I don't Jim. know either, anyway, but uh, just Dave, saying it's possible. <laughs> carry on. Yeah. I mean, I'll use, I'll use Onyx in the right situation, but these like unlimited where, Weight is at a premium, and power is, battery power is at a premium mm-hmm. as well. Uh, my phone is off the whole time because yeah. you know I might need that battery power for, for a rescue or something like that. So yeah, um, you really hopefully gotta, not, but you really got to prioritize what yeah, and, and, and with this hunt especially because there's probably nothing else like it in the continental United States. Yeah, I mean, until you get into like hunting the Himalayas, that's <laughs> the degree of difficulty. Yeah. And, and to your point, Dave, is like, well, where is it applicable? Yeah. And like, where where do you even need it? Same thing with headlamp. Well, how much moving around are you going to be doing at night on the yeah. side of a mountain? No, mm. something went wrong if you are. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You know, I mean, even if you got something down, I mean, you, you might use a headlamp a little bit. But yeah. other than that, you're using it a little bit at night, maybe when you're cooking or getting ready for bed or a little bit in the morning, just getting ready and then it's off. So, but you're yeah. talking minutes. Yeah. You know? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. We're and those work. zebras, they, I mean, they, they, they go a long time. And a cool product too, because they're not super expensive. No. Uh-huh. I've, I have $300 headlamps that yeah. I just leave at home because they're super duper heavy. You got one of the zebras? No, I've got a, a Bindi from uh, okay. Petzl, which oh, is okay. yeah. similar weight, super, super lightweight, 
yeah. you know, it's measured in grams, not not even ounces at that point. And, yeah. Uh, but that's a, a rechargeable. Mm-hmm. So you have to, mm-hmm. you can't put an auxiliary battery in it. You got to plug it into a power source. But yeah. And the Zebra is not all that lightweight. I mean, I want to say it's like four ounces maybe. Okay. But but the cool Jiminy thing about Christmas. it is that it's the, the battery power, when you combine it with the rest of your kit, that's right. where you get all the weight out of it. Sure. And you actually gain the advantage of having an unbelievable, it, they're crazy bright. I mean, they, they throw a beam so far if you go on the brightest setting. Now, you're going to burn up the battery quick on that setting. Yeah. If you need it, you got it. Mm-hmm. And because that battery can be used for other things, almost like your, your battery pack that you might carry in the field, and that's lighter than a solar panel. Oh, two, yeah. two or even three of those batteries are lighter than a solar panel. Mm-hmm. That's where you, you get the benefit is that it can be combined for other uses than just the headlamp. Yeah, That's one of so. the things I've appreciated most about um, watching you make these spreadsheets. I have no interest in making them myself, admittedly. <laughs> but watching you do these yeah. is, uh, is uh, it's actually, it's kind of like, you know, when you use a ballistics calculator and you realize that some ballistician has been slaving over all these calculations forever and then finally it just puts it in a convenient app for you just to boop, 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 up, you know? All right. But anyway, that's, that's how it works yeah. around here with Dave. But one of the things I've appreciated most is that at times you'll use gear that isn't the lightest weight piece within its category, mm-hmm. but you're using it because... It saves weight in the fact that it doesn't require you to carry an additional gear, a piece of gear right. to supplement whatever shortcomings the lighter weight model might have, mm-hmm. which then would add up to equal more weight than the thing that you are carrying. It's there's yeah. it's it's the totality. It's, of it is. It's kit. like a game of uh, remember Grandma used to like playing Rummy Cube all the time. Yeah. And then all of a sudden she'd be grabbing pieces from everywhere and you're like, what the heck is she doing? And in the end, it was just to remove <laughs> one piece from her little, like, you know, board of pieces. I don't know. Maybe that's a game not many other people I've play. Never, I, don't I don't know about it. Remy Cube, great game. <laughs> Super I'm a, fun. I'm go Very fish, strategy. Man. Look it up. You might have some time. Strategy oriented. <laughs> yeah, you may have some time. It's, uh, uh, you yeah. know, who knows? Well, we've talked about it. I mean, I'd pre- actually, a, I'd like our listeners to even, if they've got ideas. Cause oh, man. I, I yeah. mean, I've been doing this a lot, but... But uh, I'll tell you what, I, I certainly don't have the answer for everything, and I'd love to hear what listeners are doing for absolutely every, to ultra lightweight and send in ideas. Everybody's yeah. finding the trick, man. Yeah. We've we've uh, we've departed a little bit from rifles. We can get back to that, but I do have another question um, in the preparedness mindset behind <laughs> light, all being ultra light. So. I know I've been guilty of this. I know certain other people that I hang around a lot that are definitely guilty of this. Um, but uh, anyway, there we go. Probably <laughs> going out, and you think to yourself, "I'm going to be in the middle of nowhere. Mm-hmm. I got to make sure. What if something goes wrong and I'm stuck out there? You know, providing this yeah. buffer for yourself. Like if I knew everything was going to go perfect, and I was going to be out there for three days, I'd carry this, 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 and nothing more, and then mm-hmm. I wouldn't have excess. But many things often don't always go to plan. So how right. much? How much? buffer are you giving yourself in your planning are you ever doing almost rare? none and and, <laughs> okay. and almost none and, but here's the thing and yeah, here's the just thing uh, and roll the dice just, jump just don't make mistakes so, i think that's what he's saying <laughs> be perfect no here's the thing and and if you've if you've just done like one or two of these kinds of hunts that are mountain hunts what i would encourage you to do is to take a little notebook with you and every time you get back and you unpack your gear write or make a pile or write down a list of all the things you didn't use. And I would be willing to bet the vast majority of people will find that you, Oh, I brought this cause I thought I might need it. Or what if something went wrong? I might need this. And without fail, you almost never use it. And if you get in a true emergency, honestly, like, I mean, here's the thing is if, if it's a true emergency on the very last day, yeah, you're probably out of food, but the human body can go a long time without food, right? You just need water. And if you, as long as you've got the ability to procure water, which yeah, that I'm not, I'm not limiting that to exactly the amount I need, right? I mean, I I, carry, I carried a SteriPen last time, and I really liked it. So okay, cool. I can procure water, right? You got your buddy out there, um, so you can you can go a long time without certain things. I mean, if you run out of food, you can live, and that's where I carry the Sat Phone or the Inreach Mini, you know, and you can get a rescue if you need it. Um, but yeah, I find that almost always you never end up using the things that you're like, well, if we get in a true emergency, I'm going to need this. And a lot of gear can be used for you know, various things. I mean. If you're in a, say somebody, you know, has an arterial bleed for, from whatever reason, I mean, you can use a belt for a tourniquet, a belt and a stick or a, a belt and a trekking pole. I always carry trekking poles. You know, you can use a trekking pole to tighten it down. There's things that you can use like that. Um, you know, I would recommend people take 
like a wilderness first responder course or something like that um, when you're doing these types of hunts because mm. you, th- and they're good about teaching the different pieces of gear you can use to do different things to treat you know serious injuries but I mean honestly most of the time in reach mini sat phone call a rescue that's like that's your best friend I think yeah so if there comes a point and actually I picked this up from you when we were looking at the med kit side of things yeah you you'd made a statement that if something happens that you require more than a gauze, an ace bandage, maybe some butterfly closures, mm-hmm. you are in trouble. Like at that point, yeah. there's a lot more to Push the, the button. equation. Correct. You know, if, yeah. if, if I were to fall and, you know, I have a compound fracture, no amount of med kit that I could haul in would make the You'd difference. have to carry a 50-pound med kit Correct. To, to, to really deal with like, that in a way that, I mean, it, well... You can you can use the stuff you have to splint, right? Yep. If you yep. need to make a splint, you can use trekking poles, yep. you know. And that's one of the reasons I carry them, but um, you know, because it can be used that way. But they also make walking so much easier. Yeah. I don't even consider them weight. No, right. I actually, I mean, you could almost not even count them. In I your don't. Kit, my I don't think you should because I mean, they they actually enhance and aid you. Um, but yeah, Sam splints. I don't carry those. They're just, seen, they're super light. They are, but it's you know it's probably a few ounces, and, and every little thing you you carry adds. Well, I, adds I, guess, weight, I would so. assume it's probably at least yeah. a few ounces. You know, <laughs> trekking poles, man. Use that for a splint. Dave carries things that are anti gravity. Right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> one one thing I would say that that I definitely have started carrying is that that bleed kit that with uh, a tourniquet in it. Yeah, with that DJ gives, and I and I was shocked at actually how light that kit was. Yeah, um, tourniquets in and of yeah. themselves are pretty light. You know, yeah, and I, mean, I think if you carry one of those little like hemostatic, you know, powder or gauze, like one little one, I could, I could see that, but I don't well, know if one, I did. Once you told me that, though, I really did yeah. think about it. Um, I did a backcountry hunt last year in, in late September in northern Minnesota, and I was about forty-five miles from cell service. Yeah, and I thought about it, and like if I fall out of my tree. Or if I capsize my boat, yep. or if I, I mean, name the number of things that can go wrong, Yeah, very little in the way of things that I can carry in are going to make the difference. It's yep. going to be something like a sat phone or yep. an in-reach mini, which I also carry, yep. Yep. that is going to make the difference. Yep. Mm-hmm. Like at that point in time, so long as I wasn't gouged arterially and I'm bleeding out or I didn't have a yeah. skull fracture, it just comes it's down like to stop the, the arterial bleed, yep. get the cell phone out, and call the rescue. Yep, and that, just sit tight until they come yeah. get you. Cal- you know, like that's comms are key. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Ass- <laughs> assess your wherewithal. Yeah. So I, I did. I, I took my med pack. Well, I'm not going to call it a pack, but bag out. And I did. I pared it down to a few butterfly closures. Yep. Um, and I have a small suture kit, and which is probably dead weight, considering you know if if you have the ability to tie yourself up, sew so your skin. Yeah, uh, yeah. and then. A gauze and a wrap. Yeah. Uh, what else can you do? Oh, a small bottle of super glue. Yep. Um, yep. That that's it. I mean, it weighs. It's, Again, it's, multi-use. Yeah, yeah. It looks. It looks like uh, like a uh, fabric repair kit that you get with a tent. Yeah. Is what <laughs> it's is probably what like an ounce or two or yeah, something like it's that. Super yeah, small. That's my my med kit is like a, like an ounce or two. Because what else are you gonna do? I mean, I have some stuff for my feet in case you get blisters sure. in there. You know, but, but it's not that, like that. Yeah. Yeah. But there, yeah, I don't carry much. So. Mm-hmm. Boy, and that's something that can save your hunt. Oh yeah, yeah. Back on rifles, huh? Yeah, back on rifles. Yeah. I, I noticed one thing that's not on here, Dave, and I think you've touched on it before. Mm-hmm. There's not a sling. Yeah. Yep. So that's for me. You like to carry your rifle. Yep. How are you carrying your rifle if you're not carrying? Your, like, let's say you're running dual trekking poles. Yeah. So for the unlimited. Um, I, I mean, I just strap it to my backpack, Okay. you know, and there are some of the systems like oh, the, yeah. the Kifaru system where it kind of holds it in front of you. Mm-hmm. And I think that's a pretty cool system. Um, you know, for the unlimited, specifically, I really like that one. I wouldn't even, I mean, yeah. And there were places where we were, I mean, like lower fifth class rock climbing, um, <laughs> on our trip. And, and so I, I wanted that out of the way, uh, off my chest, completely on the backpack. And the way I figured it is the first day or two getting in, it was on the pack, and mm-hmm. if I saw a sheep, I was just going to have to take the pack off and get it off, you know. Um, I did have some bear spray in case, you know, that's lighter weight than a handgun and actually more effective and statistically. Um, so I did have a can of bear spray with me. Um, but, you know, that's – if I didn't have a wife and kids, I might not even carry that, to be honest. Um, just let it happen. But, yeah, then when I get up <laughs> higher, I'll I'll put it on the pack. Or they when don't I'm, call them bear hands for yeah, nothing. Yeah. <laughs> I'll just carry it in my hands. If I'm in an area where I think I might see a sheep, you know, 
Yeah. So, and I mean, really in that, it's like sheep hunting, and most guys know this when you're sheep hunting, you're not moving a lot once you get in the area where you're looking for sheep. You're glassing sun up to sun down. You might move once right. in the middle of that, but a lot of times, like up there, we, we would be in the same spot for three days at least, glassing the same spots three days in a row, Man. sun up to sun down. And so that's the other thing that makes it so difficult is you got to have that patience to just you know, really look for it. And I mean, I've read books where guys say minimum five days in the unlimited five days in the same spot. I, I've heard, I've read stories where guys on the fifth day, as the sun was setting, two Rams, two legal Rams came over the pass and right in front of him and he shot one. That's, well, that's a strong mental game, you know, and I is. know, I mean, totally different hunt, but that's how we were hunting moose two years ago with some buddies. Dude, they had, They've hunted this place several times. They had it dialed, and they get in this one canyon, essentially, and I killed a bull the first day. Mm -hmm. We didn't see another bull for five days, I think. Like, we were seeing cows, Mm -hmm. and then uh, two of us split off. Finally, we're like, we got to see some different country. Like, there's no moose in here. And uh, then uh, they uh, killed uh, two in that valley, and the biggest one of the trip was on that. Like and the, and the one you didn't day. think there was a moose in there. Well, and then because f- it had been like, yeah, we saw a bull the first day, we were able to kill it. It was awesome. And then like five days yeah. of just nothing. So when you're just sitting there and looking, you know, I mean, that's where I go on a hunts like that. I don't really feel like I need a sling. And they just they just get caught up. You mm-hmm. know, and they catch branches. They get in the way. They it's just a it's just a snag hazard. Basically, I think I think I so, certain I'm, hunts I can see them. Yeah. I must do slings wrong, but they never stay on my shoulder. Yeah, I've maybe it's just happen. me, but I, I just like I can't. I'm always futzing with it, which is yeah. kind of a pain. I find them. Um, I I I'd use them a lot, and it just depends on the hunt, and the scenario. Mm-hmm. Yeah, hundred yeah. percent. Well, something this light, you can walk around with it in your hand. I mean, just yeah, so right. Easy it to is. Carry. It is. And to your point, like that Kafaru gun bearer or you know similar system. Yeah. Man, your gun is at it's at the ready. That's a it, that is a great system. I really do like that the gun bearer that they, they have. So Ryan, yo, and Mark has one up here on the table too. Let's talk about some of these other ones. So Dave, you built or had built a very custom mm-hmm. rifle here. Yep. The ones around us are ones that are more factory options, right? For yeah. the most part. So let's talk about some of these as well. For somebody who isn't necessarily going to go and have this thing built. Mm-hmm. They want to just get a lighter weight. Yes. Rifle. What do you guys have around the table here? What what are what are their pros and cons? What are you know some of the, you have some unique sure. calibers here too? I think one quite rare one as well. So I'm gonna start with whoops. I'm gonna start with my Kimber Mountain Ascent 308. See that strap just snag him. Yeah. See, <laughs> Jim, actually, cr- yes. oh my so god, it's a, it's a good Seriously. point. I I put this sling on uh, when Jim and I went and hunted deer in Wisconsin here because oh, yeah. we were out tracking around. Uh, and so to, to your point, Mark and Dave, it's a very situational thing. Um, and oftentimes I wouldn't run a sling if I had my pack because my pack has a means to sure. put my rifle on it. Right. And if I'm going to be carrying my pack, my rifle is right there and it comes off as fast as if I were to unsling myself. Um, so we put this on while we were hunting in Wisconsin. Um, so the mountain ascent I think is one of the better options available, yeah. uh, as a factory rifle, for somebody looking for something ultralight and to speak to its weight without a scope on it and without the modified Picatinny rail, uh, it weighs four pounds, 13 ounces. That's pretty wild. We're talking light. Uh, and it, it looks more slender than the one Dave had up it here, is. too. The one Dave has up is more, it looks beefier because it's got the bigger, mm-hmm. thicker yeah. carbon barrel. It's got the tactical style stock. But this is, this is something to speak to when we're talking about ultralight things in general, not just rifles. Generally... If we have ultralight, we are giving something up. Yep. Right. We're giving up durability. We're giving up uh, some functionality. Mm-hmm. In, in the case of the stock design on the Kimber or, or any of the other rifles that we have here, they're not a full-feature stock. So it does not lend to the shootability of the rig. Mm-hmm. But if we look yeah, at the... Sp- no adjustability. Right. That yeah. kind of classic... What, what kind of style stock is that? I'm just, sorry to just a classic... A classic it, rifle stock. Rifle? Yep, sporter yeah. stock. Okay. Where We're, Dave's is more... If anybody's not, not watching, maybe picture almost like an ultralight precision rifle. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. So 
you know, when you're when you're striking out to that balance of well, what am I getting or what am I giving up? One thing I will tell you with any ultralight rifle, because I, I tend to like ultralight rifles more than I like heavier rifles, they're harder to shoot. Yes, um, because yeah. they don't have a lot of the features out of the box that say my precision rifle would. Mm-hmm. Um, the tricky part is sussing out where is that balance for you. Mm-hmm. Um, and so one of the reasons I settled on this particular rifle is it met my weight requirement. It's very light with my scope on it and uh, three cartridges in it. It's you know just barely over six and a half pounds loaded and ready to go. Um, I don't run a bipod. Uh, I run shooting sticks or my pack. Um, I really like the shooting stick option. They're super lightweight. Uh, they, they have a, a much, you know, I can shoot from the seated position. Um, I can, I can use them for other things as well. Do you use a separate shooting stick from your trekking poles? You don't have like your trekking poles set up to then also be used as a shooting stick or. So if I'm using the trekking pole, I'm in a pretty rough terrain and then right. I, yeah, then I would probably exempt the shooting stick because I don't want to carry both things because we're getting into some redundancy. But like, you know, I was on a hunt in uh, South Dakota this year. Um, I did not use the shooting sticks. I used my pack or my poles. Um, so it just, it depends on what I'm doing. I think also it depends on like, well, it depends on what you're doing. depends on the terrain, right? Yeah. Like in open country, you can generally rely on being able to lay down on your pack. Correct. If you're having to get above grass or you're on maybe potentially like a steep hillside where you're going to be shooting from a sitting position, Mm -hmm. you know, then that's where the sticks, you know, come into play. Right. Um, And so like where I hunt in Wyoming, it's not super rugged terrain that would require the use of trekking poles if I was packing something out. Mm -hmm. Uh, So the shooting sticks come with me or my pack. If I need to shoot seated, I'm shooting off my sticks. If I need to shoot prone, I'm shooting off my pack. Um, So... Like I said, we, we give up some things uh, as far as features go to make the rifle more shootable. Um, and it is an unforgiving gun to shoot. They they recoil a lot. That's for their, a 308, this right? This one is, yep. For, for their caliber, they recoil a lot. Um, I added a muzzle brake. Uh, it helps a ton. Shooting it off the bench is not something you do a lot of with your ultralight hunting rifle. You, you're in the field a lot more. Um, so, you know, you wouldn't have to put a brake on there. Um because you're going to shoot it less in the field than you are anywhere else. But I really do like the shootability off of the bench with the brake on there. It added a negligible amount of weight. Um, and then I've well, got a... That's debatable well, considering that's, our, that's true. our current uh, guest. Um, and then I have a pretty modest rifle scope on there. It's coming in at about 17 and a half ounces. It's our Viper HS 2.5 to 10. Uh, I don't shoot a lot of magnification well, so I, I generally uh, tend towards lower magnification. Um, and I'm not going to shoot this gun that far. You know, I actually look at the bullet that I'm shooting. It's it's a very specific type of projectile, very specific construction, um, and it requires a pretty specific amount of velocity to open. And so I I make my distance threshold about a mile, maybe not quite 100 feet per second inside of that that required minimum expansion. Um, so to me, this is a gun that ethically is a 400 to 500 yard rifle. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. I I personally don't hunt anywhere or anything that would require me to have any more magnification than that or any other feature set than that. I think Um, that's a really good point to bring up, Ryan, is like figuring those things out for your setup, because mentally then you can really plan your hunt you know, Mm -hmm. or you don't necessarily have to figure stuff out on the fly. Like Mm -hmm. if you see an animal, you can just assess the situation and be like, yep, I need to get there or nope, I can kill it from here. And, you know, it hasn't been a situation yet where, where I've had a a bullet or a projectile or a cartridge that it's like, oh, well, all right, you can't do that. Um, Right. Like I've never run into that. I'm sure it can, it can happen. It will happen undoubtedly. But, um, you know, I've, I made the selection in caliber and, and bullet and weight and rifle, um, with all those things kind of in play. Well, that's even a little bit like what Dave was saying about coming back to camp at the end of a hunt or at the end of a day Mm -hmm. and putting everything out and seeing what you did use, what you didn't use. Mm -hmm. I think you can do that after hunts as well. Like if you did get to shoot something, you can go back and think to yourself, okay, well that, you know, got put down. Did I need as big of a caliber as I used to put it down? Right. Which is always kind of a, I guess you can't necessarily do that as easily as you could with just seeing gear in front of you. Oh, I didn't use that. You know, there's, there's the many variables that go into actually making something expire. But, um, 
some people, they go and they get really lightweight guns, but they still just have to have it in that one caliber. I, I did that. And yeah. what was that? 300 Weatherby. Ow. Yeah, that was, uh, <laughs> again, we, we talked, you know, at the time I was hand loading like a, a fiend, you know, I was loading all these different cartridges and I was looking at ballistics tables. I'm like, oh, it's got, it's all about foot pounds of energy and velocity and this kind of thing. And, and so I was toting around an ultra light Weatherby in 300 Weatherby and I was paying for it on both ends. Um, yeah. That gun is very difficult to shoot. And we've talked in the podcast before about a shootable gun being a more ethical choice. Because if you can't shoot your really big monster cannon well, well, what good can you do it? Right. Well, yeah. and I, you know what? I, my opinion is no matter how tough anyone thinks they are, it's going to be easier to shoot a lighter recoil oh, yeah. gun every right. time. Yep. It, it just is. Yeah. So it, I don't know. I'm a fan of, I'm a fan of the, the smaller calibers. Yeah. You know? and, and well, it particularly does. Particularly if accuracy. you're going this route. And yeah. it, it increases yep. your, your efficacy uh, and, and a ability to shoot and yeah. to your point a bullet going in the right place is what kills an animal not foot pounds of energy yeah. not velocity well and selfishly your odds of coming home with that animal correct you know I yeah mean, if, yes you know if you're to the point where you're closing your eyes every time you pull the trigger yeah that's yep. a problem yeah yep. yep. and and that that was a you know the pendulum swings we've talked about that when when i first started hunting west the first thing i did was went with the biggest cartridge i could get and big country, big caliber. Yep. And the first America. animal, the first animal I took was a pronghorn, so one of the smallest animals I could take. <laughs> and I took it. I think I shot it at eighty-seven yards. Oh gosh. Yeah. And what was left? Uh, so I hit it just forward of its clavicle, uh, like in the neck, and it almost severed the head. <laughs> oh. And and so like then they step back, like rethink things, and now most of my cartridges are six five Creedmoor three oh eight. 30 out six, and I added a 280 Ackley last year for some horsepower uh, for a little bit of flat shooting. Um, but really, the more I play with it, the more I shoot rifles at distance and in, the more I ask myself, wh- why do we have anything other than a 308 or a 65 Creedmoor or not six or, or something along or those lines? 300 wisdom, yeah. maybe. Or 300 wisdom. Uh, d- but to, mm. to like, we have to match. We have to match the the cartridge to the application. Mark, you were hunting in Alaska. There's bears up there. Bears have big teeth. Um, a three hundred short mag is certainly a more than adequate thing. And you're hunting moose. They're a thousand pounds. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. So they are large man. I really the, like the twenty eight Nosler. Good cartridge. If I, was hunt, if I was hunting moose or something bigger than yep. elk or bigger all the mm-hmm. time, that twenty eight Nosler, and it it's not punishing to shoot for a. For a long action, you know, in in the it's right pretty. in the right configuration, yeah. yeah, definitely. Remind me the size of a twenty eight. So it's twenty eight seven millimeter, seven millimeter. Yeah, yep. okay. But right. you're you're pushing with that cartridge. You're able to push one hundred and seventy five grain seven millimeter. Yeah, okay. We're, we're, or larger. Sam's shooting the one one the one ninety five burgers. Yep. So you're getting and he's over three thousand feet per second on that. Yeah, too. yeah. <laughs> Good night. <laughs> Um, and it's a really shootable gun for how big it is. Right. They are. I mean, Ryan and I got that 28 Nosler set up for uh, when I was going uh, bear hunting last spring, two springs ago. Mm-hmm. Can't remember now. And yeah, super shootable. I mean, right. it's. I mean, it's a. It's a larger. It's a heavier gun, but it wasn't like, yeah, crazy heavy. Yeah. And it. Yeah, mm-hmm. those things. Those 175s are cooking. Right. Yeah. Um, but again, balance to be struck because the other part of this is cost. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So. When we start talking about ultralight rifles, like I don't know if there's a, a line in the sand mm-hmm. from an industry standpoint of what is deemed ultralight and what is not. Um, I, I think for me, that six and three quarter pound unloaded weight or unscoped weight is where we start getting into light ultralight territory. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And you, a lot of manufacturers now are, are seeing that there's a lot of viability in that for every hunter, whether you're a Midwestern deer hunter, or whether you're mm-hmm. a Western you know, big game hunter. Um, and so there's a lot of fantastic options out there that aren't going to cost like this Kimber. If you were to buy it off the shelf is $1,500 rifle. That's a lot of money. Yeah. It's a mm-hmm. ton. Um, but you can get a Tika T3 light, which is six and three quarter pounds unloaded unscoped, uh, for like 699 bucks. And it's one of the most accurate rifles. One of the smoothest actions you can get the Ruger American predator at $399 is barely heavier than that. Weatherby makes a Vanguard um, synthetic option that's only a little bit heavier than that uh, for $499. So there's a ton there. Once you start getting into the specialized 
right. uber light, mm-hmm. ultra light, then we start adding a ton of cost. When it's hard to it's hard yeah. to have dual use out of a ultra ultra light yep. gun like that gun right there, the mountain ascent. I don't know if I'd take it to the Vortex Extreme and shoot up to 1,200 yards with it and do high round counts. You you could, but yeah, would it be I, the appropriate I'm not thing? Say, yeah, exactly. Right. So right. would it be the appropriate choice? Right. Whereas that Ruger American, that Vanguard you mentioned, the TKT-3 yep. Lite, those guns, you would feel, you know, you're more comfortable carrying them around in, in hunting scenarios because mm-hmm. they're yep. not sedating heavy. Mm-hmm. But or, then or it Dave's would setup. be a perfectly yep. appropriate choice out mm-hmm. there. Right, right. And, and so, and yeah, we even talked about that like with Dave's setup, even though that's a little bit more of like a, has a little bit more tactical feel, you yeah. know, to it. It's also with those carbon wrap barrels, they're not necessarily great for high round count yeah. style shooting because it's, you know, insulating it against that steel barrel inside. Um, yeah. Right. Um, and that's, a, that's a, a huge factor in this too. Like I don't just do one kind of hunting. So this mm-hmm. rifle is very like portable from like a carrying mm-hmm. standpoint. If I was going to go walk swamp in Wisconsin or Northern Minnesota, it would be a fine rifle to do it. It's features lend it. It's low magnification scope on there is fine for taking a 40 yard shot. Whereas it's not ideal for going and hunting the unlimited unit where mm-hmm. you're going to be hunting sheep. Whereas I, I think you'd feel overscoped if you were walking through oh, the woods sure. with a six to 24. Yeah. So a lot of balance to be had there. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, uh, yeah. Yeah. Your uh, your gun here, the one Mark has. Whether what, what's this one, Mark? Weatherby Mark Five. So yeah, this is a Weatherby Mark Five Ultralight. It's an Outfitter, which is an is Ultralight. Out- ultralight a- Outfitter, I think, is yeah. what it was. Or- now, something they have in common, as well as the other one. Can you mention what the the rare one is over oh, there? Oh yeah. Too? So this is a cool one. Um, it's one of my earlier quote Ultralight rifles, and it's a Mark Five, same configuration as the one that Mark has in front of him. But it was a factory option in a cartridge uh, that's it's called the 338-06 A-square, which was a commercialized wildcat. I bought this rifle specifically to hunt moose in Minnesota, which I never did get a permit for. Then they closed the hunt down. I've never shot this gun. <laughs> I've had it like for... Like it's not been fired. No. I've never... I took the plug screws out and I put a rail on it with the intent of mounting a scope. And then I took the rail off of it and I've never fired it. We got to change that. I think I should someday. It's a cool gun. It's a super niche gun, um, but it's an ultralight, and it's five and three-quarter pounds unloaded um, and a very interesting and extraordinarily capable cartridge that unfortunately died um, on the scene and failed like a lead balloon. Uh, but, <laughs> it, it, yeah, it's kind of a bummer because it's a really neat round. Um, same gun as Mark's. Mark's is 20-some years newer. I think this gun was either built in somewhere between 1999 and 2001. Um, and uh, yeah, it's. <laughs> but the one the one thing that they have in common is fluting. Yep. So that's mm-hmm. another thing when you're not doing, let's say, carbon wrap stuff or throwing a lot of carbon fiber in places or titanium. A way to make steel stuff lighter is to flute it. Mm-hmm. So there's fluted bolts and there's fluted barrels. Yep. I liked what Ian said actually. Once we had him on the podcast, he was talking about fluting. Some mm-hmm. people mistake fluting for actually increasing rigidity in your barrel, which it doesn't. It actually maintains the same rigidity that it had before by keeping the same exterior OD, uh, uh, outer dimension or no diameter. Uh, But then it lightens it. Yes. So it's really for for lighter weight while maintaining rigidity. And I do I do want to point one thing out between like Dave's rifle or say I've got a Remington seven hundred Mountain over here. Um, Another way that a lot of rifle manufacturers will get away with a lighter rifle is they'll make the action diameter considerably smaller. So if we look at a Kimber uh, 84, whether it's a Hunter, all the way up to a Mountain Ascent, a Mark V six lug, which this is a six lug Mark Mm -hmm. V, um, or a Barrett Fieldcraft, is they have a smaller diameter action Hmm. um, in order to get away with that. A little bit less meat around the actual part where the bolt rides. If we're going to keep things all the same, if Dave's action was made out of steel, it would weigh more than this. His is made out of a much lighter alloy, titanium, so it actually weighs less than this. Um, A a comparably weighted, say, Remington 700, or or comparably chambered Remington 700, would weigh a lot more, like six to eight ounces more, just the receiver alone. Just because it's beefier. So that's one thing that you'll see on a lot of these ultralight rifles is they have a very, very reduced action dimension uh, in order to shave weight off. Um, Is that part of the reliability compromise maybe um, that you make? Or does that... Why aren't they all... 
thinner profile. Well, like that, you know, so you could not chamber a very high stepping car. Like we couldn't put a 28 nozzler on this action. Okay. Yeah. Gotcha. So we'd have to go to Weatherby's nine lug version, which is remarkably larger, ergo heavier, and you're kind of going backwards. Yeah. Whereas getting away with like a super sweet space alloy like titanium, you can you can you know bump up and caliber without adding a bunch of weight or i should say in in case head size or cartridge size without adding a ton of weight um, i don't think it really takes away from the like reliability or functionality aspect mm. of it going lighter makes it harder to shoot like yeah. this rifle wouldn't be all that comfortable because it's pushing a you know 250 grain projectile yeah. at like 2600 My feet goodness. per second so <laughs> it's 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 a lot to shoot but it's an ultralight rifle um it's a bummer i never did get that moose tag because it would have been cool to shoot a moose If you did it. get a moose tag elsewhere someday, would you take that rifle? I probably would. Yeah. It depends on where it would go. If it was if it was Alaska to where Mark went, because of the distances that you could run into, it's it's a great cartridge for probably, you know, four hundred yard shots. And really I'd have to ask myself, like, Ryan, are you ever gonna shoot further than that? And I would have to I'd have to really examine the question. I think in Alaska you would. Maybe. It, Maybe. I I have a hard time doing it for a number of other reasons. Um but I I don't know. If it was Alaska, I probably would go with something a little faster, flatter shooting yeah. for yeah. the long range aspect. Where where we were at, and again, like, you know, situation of one, but it was interesting. You were either gonna shoot a moose at probably a minimum of four hundred yards, and I ended up killing that bull at seven thirty three, which I thought was like crazy, but he ran twenty yards and tipped over and it was, worked out really well. So but like I said, men of four, you're either gonna shoot them at that or twenty yards. Right. Like that's just you're either gonna shoot them from across a canyon, mm -hmm. or down in the valley somewhere, or you were gonna sneak into the timber and kill them at twenty yards. Right. Like mm -hmm. those were your options. Right. I think if I ever do like a Canadian moose hunt, like Newfoundland or mm -hmm. somewhere like that, that's going there. Absolutely. I, yeah. I, <clears throat> I, I think I probably will. I have dies. Um, I have segregated a whole bunch of. 30-06 with a specific head stamp just to make 338-06 ammo. And it's it's been a long it's, I've had this gun for like like 10 or 12 years. And I've never <laughs> done anything with it. So one of these days I'm gonna load it up and shoot it. I hope it shoots good. Um boy, it's that just in case gun. Yeah, sure. <laughs> what about I'm noticing on on your Kimber there, you know, we're talking about reducing weight, that spiral fluting. Oh, on the bolt. On yeah, the bolt. it does yep. make a difference. It's not a huge difference, but to Dave's point. Ounces make pounds, pounds make pain. So one way you can get it looks the bolt, dirty. The bolt handle is skeletonized yeah. as well. Yeah, bolt Same handle is skeletonized. Even the even the extractor skeletonized. I think that's kind of an active um, futility there because that really is not a lot of weight savings. I think the spiral fluting on on the bolt does save a bit of weight. I, I mean, like appreciable weight, where you can be like, mm -hmm. oh yeah, that definitely weighs less than. Does it make it yeah. kind of more wobbly? No, not not really. That part's not a bearing surface here okay. so there's it's not doing anything for like contact um no it, it doesn't okay um and you wouldn't you wouldn't really be milling a, a feature on the bolt that would be a bearing surface yeah necessarily or or that it, it wouldn't really affect that part of it got it mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. um yeah two great options anyway those are good ones yeah ultralight rifles they are cool they are cool. i like them a lot. I, I think for, you know, if, if you're trying to pick out a new rifle, like, look at what you're going to be doing with it. Yeah. Um, and, and remember the shootability thing. The caliber part is the biggest part with ultralight That's rifles. That's a real big yeah. one. Yeah. I, you know, we it's get... so hard for people to not go, not go for the biggest caliber. Yeah. I see it all the time. Well, I think you, know. you, 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 you greatly increase the versatility of that mm -hmm. ultralight rifle when you start to balance all these things yep. that we've been talking yep. about. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. th this this Weatherby that I have on the table here, uh, it's a couple years old. They've since made some modifications to it. I love this rifle, but, they, but they've made some changes. They've since, you know, at press time, introduced their Mark V Backcountry, which is a really cool ultralight rifle. Yep. Um, they have a titanium action model in that as well. Uh, but not the lightest weight. In this group mm -hmm. at all, I think this rifle here, as it stands, comes in at five and three quarter pounds. Um, still extremely light. Yeah, that's pretty good. Um, you know, has some of those other features that we talked about it, and then pairing it with this new LHT, which Ryan, that's coming in at nineteen. Nineteen five. Nineteen five. So, 
uh, six five Creedmoor, so nice, you know, mellow, nice. easy shooting caliber. So this, you want to go creep the timber? Good. Yeah. Let's go do it. You yeah, know, you want to sit in the tree stand? Let's go do it. Oh, you got to shoot a deer at six hundred yards? Let's do that too. You know, and yep. that's that. There's a lot of versatility packed into a setup that's like this. Yeah, yeah you can yeah. do a lot of things with that. That's nice. Yep. Dave, is there ever a point at which you feel you'll reach a poundage and ounceage with your rifle that you're like, I'm good now? Um, I mean, yeah, you could get, I mean, I suppose it's possible you could get so light it would be hard to shoot. But, I mean, if I could make that rifle, I think it's just barely over five pounds right now. If it, if it was three and a half pounds, I'd, I'd do it. I'd at least try oh, it. <laughs> I thought he was going to say, oh, the, maybe a couple uh, ounces. Yeah. Yeah. About the limit does not exist. Yeah. Dave loves throwing down like gauntlets. Yeah. And there's some, for there's himself. some, I mean, there's some things out there. I don't know that we're quite there yet, but I know I, there's a couple guys I know who have been experimenting around with some various things that we might be able to get a rifle that's shaped with that kind of a stock shape and everything and, and shave some significant weight out of it still. Maybe a pound or a little Oof. more, but. But um, out of you know, the stock? Uh, no, out of the whole gun. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah. yeah. All right. But okay. uh, I don't even think that <laughs> stock weighs no, no. almost a pound. No, it's like twenty. It's like twenty-two ounces, I think. Twenty-three <laughs> ounces, something like that. But yeah, I mean, I think it's it's possible to get lighter, and I would I would certainly try it. I would, you know, if I could get it to three and a half pounds for the for the whole rifle, I think yeah. I'd try it, especially with a six-five Creedmoor. You know, you'd have to do it in a way that you could still revert back, though. If you start really yeah. like cutting away a lot of stuff, then at some point you might get so you're like, I yeah. wish I could go back. And then you can't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I do want to make a uh, note that all the rifles that we have here um, are shaped in the very con- like I, I guess it's their turn bolt, right? Their bolt action rifle. Yeah. There's a lot of other really good options out there in an, a light to ultralight package that isn't a bolt action. Explain. Uh, so Merkel and Blazer, these are two companies out of Germany make ultralight, and we're just talking ultralight, like five-pound guns in a single shot, uh, like a hinge action or a break mm. action. Uh, and and I think a lot of maybe it's uniquely American uh, hunters don't go that route. Right. Um, so these things are... More rounds. <laughs> correct. Uh, More rounds these things were designed expressly f- for the alpine hunter, uh, as is uh, you know often and common over there. So guys that are hunting like chamois, these little mountain antelope type creatures. Um, they're these super, super compact, lightweight, single shot rifles. Oh yeah, they'd be even shorter, wouldn't they? Yeah, they would. But it's still a 16 or whatever inch barrel. Yep, or even longer, depending. Yeah. Um, and, you know, traditionally they're wood stocked and they're, they're still around that five to five and a half pound mark. Jeez, um, wow. But I think you're going to start seeing some if of those come were, out with carbon stocks and synthetic stocks. I'd be are, willing to give those a try. Yeah, my lord. that'll, that'll give would. you an idea of, of like what kind of weight you can save. If you take yeah. a wood butt stock that is this long and you turn it into a composite material, you're talking about a significant yeah. weight savings. Huge. You yeah. might get well under five pounds or something yeah. like that. And so that that's a really good option, too. Even the Thompson Center Encore, which is an American single shot, um, you can get those pretty darn lightweight if you're crafty sure. with your barrel profiles and barrel lengths. Um, there's a lot of good options there. It does, when you see one of those with a 16 inch barrel, you swear like it's get pocket the paperwork. Gun. Yep, correct. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like yeah. like we should hide this or something. <laughs> yeah, so that's that's a good option uh, as well. And then there's another cool gun from Blazer. It's called the R8, which hmm. is a straight pull bolt action. Not, and so instead Ooh, of it being a okay, turbo, right, they've they've more or less eliminated the the action component and integrated it into the lower portion of the receiver and then um, kind of just the barrel. The bolt itself becomes almost the entirety of the action. And a couple of their models now have have trimmed the weight down quite a bit to, to six pound options or less. You're still getting a lot of functionality out of the gun. It's got a magazine in it so you can you yeah. know, have more than one round. Um, and there's even a couple of folks in the U.S. that are starting to put different barrels on them. How so, about what stocks do those come with? You? So they, they have a synth- synthetic and a carbon option as oh, well. Okay. Yeah, so you can get into a pretty neat deal. You're getting into some pretty racy territory when it comes to dollars and cents. So, you know, they're going to be they're going to be an ultra premium product, but it's yeah. a very viable option that's going mm-hmm. to kind of have a, a departure from this conventional style of bolt rifle. Um, mm. And you're getting, you're getting a pretty cool gun. I've always wanted an R8. Uh, they're they're kind of hard to come by though, but... Uh, something worth looking at if you're you're kicking around a neat option. Very yeah. interesting. Yeah, good uh, good last edition there. So what do you say? 
did this one pretty good. Tie a bow on it. Tie a bow on it. Dave, That's good. Lightweight yeah. Dave. It's always good having you on here. <laughs> People always end up asking a lot of questions. So as usual, if you have any questions or suggestions for yeah. your own ultralight stuff, definitely hit us up. Shoot over some comments at uh, Vortex Nation Podcast on Instagram, all that good stuff. So, uh, yeah. Cool. All right. We'll catch you guys next time. Thanks. See you, See you later. Guys. Bye. Bye. Have you never seen Ian's K95? Um, I don't know if I have. He's got it in 6.5 Swede. Um, the first time I ever met Ian. Is that a blazer? Yeah. The first time I met him was at. Is it that sporterized old one? No. It's oh. uh, I'm really curious on these now. So, what. He comes out to Winnequa. Everything's single shot these days. It's happening. Right? He comes out to Winnequa and he's like, oh, he's like, you're Ryan. I'm like, yeah, you're Ian. I've, I've heard about you. And he pulls out this little aluminum attache case. And uh, I'm like, what, what's in there? And he's like, oh, go, go ahead and open it up. And I open it up and it was a Blazer K95. And I'm like, no way. I've never seen a K95 in real life. And uh, snapped it together. He's like, I zeroed it last year. It should be, should be on. And the scope is completely separate from the optic. You set it on, it's got these neat little cameras. Oh, I remember this right. gun now, yeah. yeah. <clears throat> and uh, so it should be zeroed for 100 yards. And so the plates at Winnequa at 100 yards, I centered it up. He had a mill dot scope on it, and so like it bracketed the mill marks. Exactly. Isn't it like that really old collis or something? No, this one, he actually had a Bushnell on it. Oh, time. okay. And I pulled the trigger and just center punched the plate. He's like, yep, it's so zeroed. The K95 <laughs> is a single shot. Yep. And and they, they, but they don't make them in carbon fiber yet? Not, not oh, yet. Oh, wait, what's that? That is, oh. They do. Oh, oh no. Oh, it's a thumb hole. Now we've done it. All right, that'll wrap it up for this episode of the Vortex Nation podcast. Thanks, everybody, for listening. Hit that subscribe button so you can always stay up to date on the latest happenings over here at the Vortex Nation podcast. You can also follow us on Instagram at Vortex Nation podcast. Again, everybody, thanks and happy hunting and shooting. We appreciate it. Have a good one.